Professor Genevieve Bell is, of course, the director of the, the School of Cybernetics at ANU and the 3A Institute, uh, very much looking into how algorithms, AI, computing, cybernetics um, reshapes our world and asks the big questions about how do we research this and how do we make sense of this to also educate um, the next generation to you know, take us forward into the future in, a, in the most positive way. It is daunting to be here. It's a little daunting to be back in front of living, breathing human beings, not a screen. Uh, it's certainly daunting to be in a room with people who were part of the history we're here to celebrate. You knew the founders. These are your stories. These are stories that you have carried through your work with your students. These are futures that you are also crafting. And I realized, like, Vincent, I need to uh, acknowledge I'm an interloper. My background is in cultural anthropology. Uh, my area of expertise is, or was originally, Native American ethno history, feminist, and queer theory. You might ask how someone like that ended up at Intel in the 1990s. The short answer involves a man and a bar, because whilst I might have been an anthropologist, I was also Australian, and I was living in Silicon Valley, and that was where the action was at. So a man in a bar set me on my path a very long time ago. Uh, as a result of meeting him, I ended up at Intel, where I have now spent nearly 25 years looking at the intersections of technology and culture and thinking about how you might use what it is that people care about to inspire the next generation of technical production and technical activities. I find myself back in Australia in year five of a new adventure at the Australian National University. And what I want to do for the next 30 minutes is tell you some stories about the past, present, and future of computing. And what better place to do it than at a place celebrating the 70th, well, really 71st, anniversary of the first computer and the first computing conferences. Wayne reasonably said at that first conference, CIRAC, or CILIAC in those days, was here and was in fact, well, it did a number of things. It played music. I'm here to tell you that the review in the paper of that music said that it sounded like a refrigerator defrosting out of tune, uh, which might not have been its best review. Uh, I think it was probably a moment where people looked at this object and wondered what that future would look like. And so I want to reflect back on those stories and on the moments that have come in between and on where I find myself going next. But first, I too want to acknowledge where all conversations start in Australia. And for me, having come home from 30 years in the United States, this is a wonderful thing to get to do. I want to acknowledge where we are today, on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. I want to acknowledge this is land that was always sacred and was never ceded. And I want to acknowledge that all the work we do proceeds from the work and the knowledge that was already created in this place. This is a place like many others in Australia where Aboriginal people have been for 20 to 80,000 years. Places where people have built systems and knowledge and have had technical apparatus and ways of communicating information over decades and generations. And we stand in those footsteps and we have to both be responsible to them and aware of them and have them thread through all of our work. It is one of the extraordinary advantages we get to have in this place that is not true in many others. And how we think about infusing it into our work ought to be the starting point to everything. And so that's where I want to start. I want to start in a place called Pankai Warahuna, 2,007 kilometers from here, so Google Maps tells me. Going west, hmm, slightly north, at this place a long, long time ago, the ancestral spirit of the red-bellied black snake and the ancestral spirit of the green snake met and they made camp and they spent the night and they talked about their long journeys to that place, one of them coming all the way from Alice Springs and the other coming all the way from the Kimberleys and they rested at that place tired from a long journey and it was one of the very last places both of those ancestral figures were to rest. The name Pankai Warahona comes from an Arabana word, it means white ribs and people say that their ribs were white in those snakes because they were so tired from such a long set of journeys. This place is now beautiful. I'm sure it's spectacular today, but were you to go there in an average rainfall year, you would find red dirt and white flowers and little tiny pink daisies. You would find crystalline mound structures with water bubbling up from the Great Artesian Basin. Were you to camp in that place, you would have found yourself on three important trade routes that moved red ochre from Parachanilla up into Central Australia, that moved grindstones from what is now Anastasia to almost all over Australia, 
where other goods and services flow down that route. But if you were in this place in December of 1850, well, 1871, so over 150 years ago, you would have seen a man sitting on one of those mounds making this sketch. His name was Benjamin Herschel Babbage. He was the son of Charles Babbage. He had come to Australia at the request of the government of the British colonies to help do geological surveys of Australia, of South Australia in particular. He was a trained engineer. He had worked with Brunel. And in 1870 and 1871, he was asked by Charles Todd to go and survey the first section of the Overland Telegraph Line from Port Augusta to the peak just south of Unadatta. And so in December of 1851, he found himself sitting, sketching this site to work out where was going to be the best place to put cypress poles at 80 metres distance from one another, so that over the next six months, hundreds of Australians and many immigrants to this country, along with camels and horses and maps and theodolites and all kinds of other gear, could string a single piece of number eight galvanised wire from Adelaide to Darwin and connect that line from undersea cables at Darwin through Batfia, Java, all the way back to England. And in August 1872, so 150 years ago this year, that wire was connected. And Charles Todd, in a manner that sounds remarkably like the texting of some of the people in this room, texted everyone. He put his little Morse code key in and he sent messages all over the English-speaking world to go, we did it. In 18 months, we strung a piece of wire three and a half thousand kilometers through land that no one had surveyed or traversed before. And it was an engineering feat, to be sure. It took 36,000 poles, most of which had to be carted in because there weren't trees in these places and certainly not trees tall enough. It took miles or kilometers of wire. It took an extraordinary number of human beings doing something quite remarkable. And the engineering feat is something we celebrate all the time. We talk about it that way. We don't so much talk about the other thing that happened the day that cable was connected, which is that something profound changed in Australia. Information separated from transportation. Communication no longer needed a boat. It didn't need a train. It just needed a number eight galvanized wire and a trained operator. And suddenly the digital world that we talk about now came into existence in a proto form in that moment and Australia became a different place. The world we live in now in some ways owes its beginnings to places like Strangway Springs and men like Benjamin Herschel Babbage. Now of course the fact that the poles that carried that signal sat on country that had been places where people communicated for 60 to 80,000 years means that our world began and a whole set of other worlds continued. And how we thread those two stories together is for me the work we all always get to do. So we could say it started when CIRAC almost turned on in 47, but there was a power shortage. We could say it started when CIRAC turned on in 49 or when it sang music in 1951. But I like to imagine it really began in 1872, 150 years ago, when someone wired the country. So where does that leave us now? And what on earth does all of that have to do with cybernetics? <laughs> so what it has to do with cybernetics is that simple. Cybernetics is a story we tell about systems, about systems that bring together the ecological, the human, and the technical. We didn't have the word cybernetics when this system was built, but looking back on it, I'm pretty convinced it was a cybernetic system. It was all about how did you put humans in the loop, in this case, literally, in a repeater station, with a signal coming in one side and a signal going out the other and a human in the middle amplifying it in a very particular place. But because we're at a conference talking about computing, I thought we should probably start at the other beginning. Wayne tipped his hand to that and gave all the genealogies of all the computers that turned on. And that's certainly a place where stories about cybernetics could commence. They could commence with stories about computers and their precursors. I tend to be very partial to stories about the giant brass brain, which was a mechanistic weather calculating machine in uh, New Hampshire, lovingly called the old brass brain, after there were computers, but for a while, just the giant brass brain. We had computers that were switched on all over the world, in England, with the Colossus and Babe, or Baby, with the ENIAC and the ILIAC, 
with CIRAC, with the Zeus in Germany. There is always an interesting debate about who gets to call what a computer and under what circumstances and why. But what we do know is that in that moment and in those moments, we had a profoundly different notion about what the work was that computers did. We transitioned from thinking about computers as people to computers as devices. And we started to have to think about them as objects that required work. We can tell lots of stories about CIRAC, but my favorite is just how big it was and how loud it was and how smelly it was. It turns out when you need to run something at nearly 40 degrees Celsius to keep your mercury warm, it smells bad because all the dust in an academic building, go figure, is burning. So when you talk to Peter about those last days of CIRAC, what he tells you about is the way it smelt and the way it sounded and the fact that it was like a living, heaving, breathing thing. And we don't much imagine that because when Kai talks about the two supercomputers in his pocket, he's not thinking that they are heaving, living, breathing, smelly things, at least I hope he isn't. But back in those days, computers took up space. They required constant curation. They required all kinds of work. It's different now, but in those days, many of our stories start with that. They start with the curation of machinery and machinery that felt somewhat expansive. It's certainly the case in Philadelphia that the early owners and managers and workers of the ENIAC joke that in Philadelphia, people used to say you knew they were computing at the naval station because the lights in your kitchen flickered. It took six suburbs worth of power to run the ENIAC, which meant that Philadelphia knew it was happening. They didn't know what was going on, but they knew something was going on. So computation left a trace, right? And for all of the pioneers involved in this moment, I imagine they dreamt big, thought big, literally managed big, and were desperately trying to work out what came next. Less than 10 years later, a different collection of people, but with lineages back to that first collection, decided they knew what came next. In 1955, a group of people wrote a grant proposal to the Rockefeller to fund a research summer camp, basically, at Dartmouth in 1956. They said they needed money for a two-month, 10-man study. It did say man. Um, there was a woman there, uh, Marvin Minsky's wife, Gloria. She took this photograph. Uh, much like many of the early histories of computing, uh, the ideas about gender are somewhat subterranean, but you can find them when you go looking. Here they were pretty clear about who was going to be doing the studying. They were also pretty clear about what they wanted to do and pretty clear they needed a label for it. Now let's be also clear, in 1955, AI wasn't a technology, it was a research agenda. It was a way of galvanizing a series of competing agendas and bringing together people to define what might come next for computing. It's probably also important to remember in that moment in time that the people who were the driving force behind that conversation sat inside large American companies. It's Nathaniel Rochester at IBM, and Claude Shannon at Bell Labs, and graduate students at MIT and Harvard, who are, I suspect, in the true tradition, I'm sorry to report this to you for you students in the room, in the true tradition of the academy in 1955, there were people in industry with the money and people in the universities doing the legwork and the people in the universities doing the legwork were all postdocs. I'd like to say things have changed, I'm not convinced they have. Happily, at least for those graduate students, they went on to have extraordinary careers in this space and it opened up all kinds of things for them. But the early conversations about AI were also profoundly interwoven with stories about what companies would do with the computers they were building. For IBM and Bell, they were making big computers and placing big financial bets and wanting to know what would come next. And how to think about what was coming next involved working out what would you do with that computational power once you got past adding and subtracting and making the lights in Philadelphia flicker. Surely you would want something more. And let's remember in the 10 years that separate those first computers in this moment, computers have gone from being effectively half the size of this room to the size of one of these tables. So things have changed. And so people start saying, well, what will come next? If the rate of growth continues on this amazing decadal shrink in size and increase in power, what might happen next? Well, they imagine that what would happen next is computers would understand communication, they would be able to understand abstractions and concepts. They'd be able to do work currently done by humans, which for those of us who've ever written a grant proposal, we fully recognize as the line you throw in to make it sound bigger than it is, and that the machines would learn for themselves. They thought they'd get that done in 10 years. I applaud them for their ambition. Uh, I think it's safe to say they didn't quite get there on that time scale. <laughs> 
I think it's safe to say for some of us who work in that space, we might still be trying to do some of these things and increasingly wondering precisely what it all meant. In amongst these, for Joseph McCarthy, who was at this event, he actually was deeply interested in what would happen not if computers could be made to simulate intellect, but creativity. He spent a lot of time pondering what it would mean to imagine not just that machines would think, but that they would believe. His line was frequently, if you could teach a machine to think, it would soon believe. Uh, and he then imagined what that might look like, not in a science fiction sense, but in a scientific critical inquiry sense. Perhaps it wouldn't have surprised him then that another 10 years later, back on the other side of the Atlantic, a woman named Jason Reichart would have the first event to bring together everyone who was making art with, through, and of computers. She spent three years and a lot of money, government money, industry money, to find all the people around the world who were working at the intersections of computers and art. And at this event that premiered in London, uh, in the Design Museum on the Thames, and would then find its way to Washington DC and then to the Exploratorium in San Francisco where it was the first exhibit in a newly minted science and technology museum. At this first exhibit, she brought together people like N.J. Park, who we would now know as kind of the most important of the new media artists, South Korean, worked with televisions and light. She would have people like John Cage and Nicholas Negroponte, who were not yet household names, but would become them. She brought together people from Japan who had worked out how to hack an IBM printer and used Fortran to produce that piece of art, which seems like a delightful misappropriation of Fortran, if ever I have seen one. They also, in order to get access to the printer, had to win a competition, sit next to the chairman of IBM locally, and convince him at dinner that they should let, be let into the printing office to use the printer to make art. I imagine this was a pretty big sell in 1967, but they got it done. At this exhibit, you saw all manner of things. Music, light, poetry written by computers, computers generating graphics, the very first uh, computer rendered graphics are here. The very first data visualizations that we would recognize as such turned up here. This was a place where a whole lot of people who sit in my field uh, at the intersections of anthropology and technology first were inspired to think about what computers would do. So people like Gillian Crampton-Smith, who would create the interaction design program at the Royal College of Art, as well as a whole lot of Americans who would go on to make the first experiments in virtual reality, the first experiments in gaming and computer graphics. She tipped her hand just a little bit here because this exhibit was called Cybernetic Serendipity. Uh, at this exhibit was also a man named Stafford Beer, who will probably not be known to any of you in this room, but Stafford Beer is responsible for bringing organizational development theory into Britain. He is also responsible for shaping Brian Eno's entire destiny and in turn David Bowie's. So in case you wonder, because Vincent seemed to think that computing was never cool, he's just wrong. It turns out the stories that shaped computing shaped people like Eno who in turn shaped, well, Bowie and talking heads and craft work in one glorious summer of complete cybernetic insanity. Exactly. Same time, same place, same bat station, same San Francisco, another ACM conference, uh, 1968, December. Doug Engelbart, at this point a researcher at Stanford, decides that he is going to show the world the future. And in a moment that I suspect felt a lot like 1951, he did a 90-minute live demo which was brave. Even Steve Jobs wouldn't do what Doug did that day. He showed things that now sound like really boring. He showed cut and paste, and the mouse, <laughs> and file systems, and indexing, and hypertext, and the internet. And of course, because he was showing things that no one had ever heard of and didn't have names, he had to explain them all. And the explanations of each one of those things, looking back at it now, is kind of extraordinary. While he explains to you that he's going to put the cursor over each letter so they light up, and then I will get to the end, and I'll hit the cursor again, and it will highlight the whole word, and then I can cut that word off this screen, and then I can move the cursor over here and put it on this page, and you're like, oh my god, you've described cut and paste, and that took a minute, and you did it live. <laughs> and of course, he's not just doing it live, he's doing it down a phone wire and a satellite link up to Stanford, 50 miles away, in real time. 
Stuart Brand is operating the camera at the other end. So Wired Magazine, The Well, The Long Now Foundation, Stuart is the cameraman. Doug knows it's a theatrical moment and if you suddenly feel the need, and you will not do it right now, but if you suddenly felt the need, you just go to Google and type Doug Engelbart, mother of all demos, 1968, and you can see the whole thing. And it is glorious. And for everyone in the room that day, and there are people who claim to be in that room who could not possibly have been in that room because of both the size of the room, fire marshal's requirements, and frankly, their age. <laughs> but for the people who were in the room that day, they knew that they were seeing the future. They knew they were seeing something that was going to be what the world would be. They didn't know what the names were yet, but they knew they were looking at the beginning of everything. And the people that were in that room went on to make the personal computer and the mouse and cut and paste and hypertext and file structures. And of course, Doug, never one to rest on his laurels, went on to make the internet. Because the next year, it is Engelbart and SRI and Leonard Kleinrock at UCLA computer scientists, who work out how to connect UCLA and Stanford over the phone wires. So AT&T, grateful participant in this particular activity. And it is perhaps also a glorious beginning of the internet because it feels a lot like the internet today. Although we obviously we're calling it something different then. Because you've got Doug and Leonard in two different offices, in two different university campuses, on the phone with the computer in front of them because how do you verify that it's happening, right? And Leonard is trying to log on to Doug's machine, basically. And so Leonard says to Doug, I typed an L, do you see the L? And Doug's like, yeah, see the L. Oh, you're good. I typed the O, do you see the O? Yep, says Doug, see the O. I typed the G, do you see the G? Yep, I see the G. And then the system crashes. <laughs> It took another two weeks to get it back up and running to get to be able to type in log in, because that was obviously the second word that didn't quite happen. If you go prowling around the corridors of SRI today, the room in which this happened has three filing cabinets, a dusty table, and inexplicably a baseball bat in it. Because the thing about computer sciences is we're not very good at celebrating the places where we made history, and we're not very good at preserving the places that were important in our stories. And I find that a fascinating feature or a bug of who we are as a community. But this moment in 1968 is a hugely important one. And you know, we go on to then add UCSB, so University of California, Santa Barbara, and of course, Utah. Utah, because Ivan Sutherland is there. Santa Barbara, I've never quite worked out what that was about, but I know it is someone who is in that conversation. So those four universities are the original ARPANET. And then we slowly, steadily connect other people. Australia doesn't get into this game until the 1980s, early, uh, through a deal enacted between the Vice Chancellors of Australian Universities and the National Science Foundation in the United States. The NSF graciously agreed to pay for the connection to America for Australia. I'm happy to report, in true Australian fashion, we went through our initial tranche of data in a month. It was supposed to last us a year. Uh, we then had to go back to the NSF and ask for another year, uh, and they gave us that. We went through that in even less time, at which point the vice chancellors of the Australian universities, in a move that does somewhat resemble the University of Sydney's relationship to CIRAC, briefly wondered if they should turn the internet off, because it seemed to be very expensive, and it wasn't clear to them precisely what value it was adding. You can imagine that some of your predecessors in your various roles had words about why the internet might need to stay connected and why it is that Australia might want to be part of a global conversation. But there's always been a tension between the technology, the infrastructure, its regulation, and its paymasters. And the complicated dance there has never been simple or easy. So, okay, that's one story about computing. Cybernetics is kind of peeking through. I think there's another one I want to tell you instead which is that lurking underneath all of those moments and all of those people and all of those ideas, there is for me a different set of ideas and it's one that I'm committed to reanimating at the Australian National University. And I do use the word reanimating deliberately here. Think Frankenstein, but less messy. So, what is the unexpected wellspring? Well, the unexpected wellspring is a collection of people who gathered in a hotel in New York City in 1946 to talk about what the world of computing would be like and remember, 1946, computers are turning on, but 1946 is also a moment right after World War II, 
We have seen what World War II could bring when you brought computers into the loop. For a whole lot of people who were scientists and mathematicians and proto-computer scientists, because we didn't quite have that name yet, worried that what had been done with technology during World War II was an increased automation of death. And they were deeply concerned that maybe that wasn't a good idea. And that maybe what we needed to do was have a much more deliberate and generative conversation about what computing should be, how it should be used, and where people should sit in those conversations. That maybe it shouldn't just be about aiming guns faster and faster, maybe it should be about other things. And those conversations included the who's who of the first half of the 20th century. John von Neumann is there, Norbert Wiener is there, Northrop is there, philosopher at Yale, Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead, both anthropologists, are there. There are psychologists there, Arturo Rosenbluth, who is probably the leading light in neurobiology out of Mexico, is there. Licklider, who would create DARPA and the internet, is there. Uh, Jerome Weiner, who would be the president of MIT, is there. It's a heady group of people. And over a decade-long sweep, they debate what the future of computing should be and about how we should think about the role of computers and humans and the environment and everything. And eventually, in fact, it doesn't start out being called cybernetics, it's all about consciousness. But in 1946, Norbert Wiener publishes a book and the word cybernetics takes on a whole new currency. He means a lot of things by it, but for him and for his colleagues, they are profoundly interested in this notion of how you might create a grammar or a language or a point of view about technical systems and about the communication between technical systems and human systems. So think back to the telegraph problem, because this is really in some ways that problem. And he wanted to think about what would that science look like and what would be the pieces of the puzzle. And he grounded it in a couple of key ideas. And I want to rehearse those briefly and carefully here. Because for me, one of the things that's hugely important about the cybernetics that my team and I are interested in litigating in the 21st century is that this is not about going back to those conversations, it's about going forward with those conversations. And so for me, there are five key threads that you can pull from 1946 to the present that feel really useful and instructive. And none of them would be a great surprise to anyone in the room. The first one is the theoretical piece that Norbert and his colleagues hung cybernetics on, which was the notion of the feedback loop and circular causality. The idea that in any system, its output is its future input, which is a devastatingly simple thought, but also actually quite provocative. Every time I say it to people who aren't in this broader community, they look at me and write it down. I'm like, it's not my idea, it's an old idea. But the idea of the output being the future input is an idea in which all systems thinking should start, but as soon as you imagine that that output and input have humans, the ecological and the technical, you know you're in a complicated place. And for Norbert and his colleagues, the idea that any system had to also be a set of reciprocal relationships between things in the system. You couldn't move one thing without imagining it would impact all the others and not necessarily in a linear or equalized fashion. I'm willing to suggest that over the last two years, were Victor still here, he would say that it took the government a little while to work this out. That if you change one bit of the system, it may actually change other bits of the system, or if you fail to change one bit of the system, you cannot expect other bits of the system will somehow also mysteriously change by themselves. So this would be anything you might want to say about vaccine rollouts or border closures, the complexity of which pieces of the system you need to move and how to do it, very messy. Second piece of cybernetics that I think is hugely important and that I find particularly compelling now is the notion that you cannot imagine a system without also imagining that it has a politic. And here I don't mean left or right, I mean a politic in the sense of having a point of view. It is very clear when you look at the early history of computing that those computers were built with an idea about the world that they would sustain, the world that they would create, about what the values of that world were, about who would be in it, about who the users would be. Part of our challenge is how we make those conversations explicit, not tacit. So how is it we do a better job of surfacing who it is that we have in mind when we build that system so that we can also ask ourselves the question of who might we be missing? Who are we potentially disempowering or empowering? What is the vision of the world we are creating? And what might be missing from that story that we need to talk more clearly about? Whether that means asking the question about where is all the electricity coming from to power the data centers that we think will underwrite our AI futures, or 
in imagining this delightful new service to help me find people to make friends with on a university campus, what might be the social landscape we create? Or in thinking about a fully immersive digital world we want to build, how do we want to think about bodies and embodiment in it? There are questions we ought to be asking for ourselves and teaching our students to ask. Technology here is not neutral. It, it always encodes a value. The challenge is how we find the space to surface those values. For me, one of the ways to do that is another one of the lessons from the early cyberneticians, which is that you have to do it through iterative conversation. You cannot have a point of view and a solution emerge in one conversation in 10 minutes. It took the Macy's collection of people a decade. I don't think we have a decade, but I don't think we should imagine the building the future gets done in a day or in one citation of a science fiction novel. I think building the future requires work. It requires iterative conversations. Those conversations have to accumulate. When you go back and read the histories of the earliest practitioners, of even computer science before it was so called, one of the challenges was that people came from different fields and everyone had their own shorthand and their own theoretical predispositions and they were desperately inclined to ignore everyone who didn't share them. And it took a little while to work out that the economists weren't crazy, maybe, and that the psychologists possibly had something to add and that the anthropologists might have something to contribute and that you probably just shouldn't lock the mathematicians in the coffee room and not let them out again, even if it is tempting. Uh, and it took time to create a space in which you could hear other voices and other points of view and create a shared vocabulary. Fourth piece of that puzzle means that you also actually have to work out how to manage what I'm increasingly calling productive discomfort. Part of the virtue of having multiple voices in the room is that you get to disagreement. One of our temptations of late has been to manage disagreement very quickly away. I think there are ways of thinking about how we maintain discomfort. And here I do not mean antisocial behavior. I mean finding ways to allow disagreement to be surfaced and used to generate new ideas. This was something the Macy's Conference and its practitioners were incredibly good at. But how we think about teaching our students to recognize when they're in a moment of productive discomfort and lean into it rather than walk away from it, and how we ourselves both, uh, I don't know, role model this and celebrate it is an interesting challenge when one of the ways we are rewarded is by reinforcing disciplinary boundaries. We're rewarded by talking about the people who aren't like us and by creating rigid barriers between us and others rather than saying, actually, all those people need to be in the conversation. And oh, by the way, the conversation is going to take a little while and feel a little uncomfortable. So how we manage that and how we teach our students to do that and create the spaces for that is in some ways, certainly where I sit, an interesting but hugely important challenge. And then last but by no means least, when I said that you could get straight from cybernetics to David Bowie, one of the things I have come to realize is that as I spend more time with the cybernetic canon, I find more cybernetic children. Uh, it's a little bit like those moments as a kid where you get obsessed with something and you discover it's everywhere. I had a moment with agapanthus when I came home and suddenly I found that they grew everywhere. Cybernetics is like that. You pretty much find it anywhere. Open a book, it'll be in the index. Read someone's biography and you suddenly go, oh, is that what you were up to? Okay, that's interesting. Of course, what that actually points to is the notion of an idea that was strong enough to hold its form, but flexible enough to allow others to take it and do something different with it. One of the extraordinary things about the history of computing is that it is riven through with stories of people taking an idea and doing something different with it. It's one of the things we're celebrating today. It's one of the things that characterize Piercy and his legacy. It's one of the things that characterizes the biographies of almost everyone in this room that I know well and the ones I don't know well. We are very good at creating things and letting other people do things with them. We're not always so good at reflecting about what that says and why that's important. And for me, it's these twin notions about strength and grace. An idea that's strong enough that we care about it, but that we can have enough grace to let it go and let someone else do something else with it. I like to imagine that had Norbert and his colleagues been alive today, they'd be okay with me taking cybernetics and doing something new with it. And that's precisely what we're doing. So I wanted to end with an invitation the School of Cybernetics at the Australian National University came into existence on January 1st, 2021. It's always good to start a new school in a pandemic and an economic crisis in the higher education sector. I recommend it as a character building exercise. <laughs> it is also really good to get to build a new school. I realize after 25 years in Silicon Valley, I'm never gonna be a good academic, but I am a happy builder. Let me make things and I will always be a happy, 
an energised human being. The delight about getting to build something new in this moment is that I don't get to do it with a blank slate. I get to do it with 70 years of computing history in this country, 150 years of engineering history in this country, and 60,000 years of traditional knowledge to inform what we are doing. I get to take an idea that has been multiply litigated and argued over actually centuries and do something new with it. And that is the most exciting thing you can begin to imagine. We have graduate students and PhD students. We are hiring, we are contemplating how to teach outside of the formal curriculum, because I firmly believe there's a whole lot of people you need to bring along on this conversation. But here's the other thing I learned in Silicon Valley beyond learning how to be a builder, is that while Silicon Valley tells stories about lone inventors and the history of computing, traffic's in those stories. The reality is nothing that was worthy got built by a single person alone. It always got built because of relationships and complicated uh, conversations and because no one had to do it by themselves. So here's my ask. We're building something new. We're building something in a space I imagine many people in this room and many people that you are related to care about profoundly. And the very last thing I want to do is do it by myself. I don't want to be a single voice or a single name. I want to have a community. I want my students to have a community. I want my staff to get to be part of a broader conversation. So if you sit here and think, hmm, cybernetics, interesting, you will find me, you will track me down, you will come visit because we are allowed to visit now. And I hope what you'll do is let us build something that 70 years from now we get to talk about too, as being something built in Australia and taken out to the world and something that mattered and made meaning. And with that, I want to stop and say thank you. Thank you.